Good morning, everybody. I'd just like to commence our service by reading from the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. Just pray briefly. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you will be with us this morning in this time together and that we will learn more of you and draw closer to you. Amen. So I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this, our second uh, of our Displaced May Mission Month meetings. Um, I'd like to especially welcome Robert and Margaret Love, who's our visiting speakers this morning. Uh, Robert is going to bring us a, a short mission spot. They, they uh, are members of the Wycliffe uh, organisation. He'll tell us all about that, as well as uh, speaking to us from Isaiah later. And... Uh, I don't think there's any other things we need to uh, tell you or announce because everybody knows everything and we're all still being very COVID safe. <clears throat> but uh, I want to share you a, so a short story <clears throat> from my own experience. It happened about five or six years ago and um, <clears throat> on this occasion uh, our grandchildren were staying with us uh, for a visit and the routine when they stay with us, there's four of them, um, is that uh, I get up early and they get up very early and I get them breakfast and get them dressed and then um, I have to get myself ready and go to work. And so uh, they uh, amuse themselves with um, the things we give them to play with. So uh, the oldest of them at this time was about five or six and uh, <clears throat> we'd gotten up, had breakfast. I think it was probably pancakes. And uh, they had done their thing and I'd gotten ready and it was time to say goodbye. And uh, so I gave each of the little girls, there's three of them, a hug and a kiss. And then young William was there playing with a, a toy on the floor. And I said, goodbye, William. And he didn't even look up from what he was doing. He said, bye, Granddad." Thanks for coming. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, this is my house. <laughs> you came here to see me. <laughs> and you can't even look up from what you're doing to give me a kiss and a hug. And uh, I know the scripture says that from uh, the mouths of babes comes forth praise. Uh, but sometimes I think they give us little reflections of ourselves. And so I was forced to think, do I take my heavenly father for granted like William did? 
do I get so busy and occupied with the things he's given me, with my family, with possessions, with... Uh, when I come to his house, do I get so busy with uh, singing and with connecting with people, having fellowship, uh, even with um, reading, that I actually forget and don't take that time to connect with himself, with his own person and presence. And so I thought right now we would just have about a minute of quietness while each one of us has that time to connect with our Heavenly Father. You can tell him about the things that are bothering you. You can tell him, if you like, thanks for coming. You can ask him to forgive you for anything that you need to be forgiven for. Tell him most of all that you love him. And then after a minute, Brian Stone will come up and lead us in the family prayer. Father, we continue to come to you in prayer. We thank you, Father, uh, that you are our Father. And we pray that you will continually remind us not to take you for granted, but to always uh, thank you and be aware that we can come to you in prayer at any time. So we pray, Father, that our church may be constant in prayer and thank thankful to you at all times. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom at this time to meet together, both actually and virtually uh, this morning. So we thank you, Father, for the gifts of uh, technology uh, that enable members of our church family and, and others to join us in worshipping you this morning and indeed throughout the week. Father, we especially uh, thank you, Father, for the provision of our speaker this morning and Robert and Margaret Love, as I come from the Wycliffe Bible Translators, we do thank you for their love for you and their willingness to come here and, and uh, worship you with us and uh, tell us a little bit, bit more about the work of Wycliffe. Uh, we also th thank you, Father, that um, we have uh, some extra connections to Wycliffe with Jared and Bethany, uh, Killy and, and their son. We do pray for them as they seek your guidance in the future for their future ministry. And we do pray, Father, for the future, uh, for the, uh, the other speakers in the next few weeks that are coming to share with us about your mission throughout uh, the whole of this world. We pray particularly for Patina, Albert at this time, uh, that's, and Patina's back in Australia uh, from uh, Thailand, uh, from working with the ethnic Thai people. We do pray for Patina and we th praise you, Father, for her safe return uh, in, the, in the last month or so and uh, back in Australia. And we pray for her as she's on a time of rest and uh, refreshment and deputation, uh, that you will bless her in that. And uh, particularly, we pray that you will relieve her mind uh, of the need to raise funds to uh, be able to say so that she can return uh, to her work in Thailand. We do pray, Father, for we're reminded of all the, those brothers and sisters who suffer in your name all over the world and uh, who share in that, great, that same great gift of salvation through your son. Uh, at this time, they may face injustice, opposition, and even death uh, because of their faith in you. We pray for them. We pray for heal, healing and peace for all those that are well, unwell at this time. Uh, we pray for uh, perseverance amidst the physical and psychological stress of, um, of isolation. We pray for those that are, are grieving at this time and for them, those that have not been able to, to meet uh, with their family that are also sick or, or ill. And we pray for those who suffer in silence 
and uh, are finding this time a very challenging one, both physically and psychologically. Lord, we do pray for those that are at, um, at home uh, watching this service this morning and throughout these days who are uh, elderly or vulnerable and, uh, and they uh, feel a lot safer at home, that you will bless them. And uh, help us, Father, to make an effort to contact them and to encourage them at this time. Lord, for our continuing ministry in this church and, and through our denomination, we pray for our Baptist Youth uh, Ministries State Youth Camp. It's not so much a camp except a camp in each other's home watching and, in, and uh, cooperating in a virtual sense. We pray for them and we pray for that organisation. We pray for uh, Justin and Cathy and Cathy particularly in her um, leadership role and organisation role in that, in that ministry. And we pray for them as they are attending, attending that uh, state youth camp. We pray for our pastor, John and Marianne and Jackson Flynn, as they're taking uh, a break, a well-earned break over these holidays. And for others that may be um, travelling, we pray that from our fellowship, we pray that you will give them travelling mercies. So, Father, be with us now as we continue to worship you and to hear of the work that you are doing uh, through Wycliffe, we do uh, uh, pray, Father, that you will bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Bible reading. It's an odd Bible reading because it's a Bible reading about somebody standing up in front of a congregation and reading from the Bible. <coughs> Except I'm not Jesus, thankfully. From Luke 4, 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as his custom and he stood up to read. He read from the scroll of Isaiah that was handed to him and it said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were upon him. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, thank you, Peter and everyone. Thank you for your warm welcome today. I might just turn this up a little bit because I'm so tall. (laughs) It smells lovely, by the way. uh, (laughs) Thank you. The spray is uh, is a lovely forest glade smell, I think. So, uh, but uh, yes, it's uh, great to be with you, as I've said, and uh, it's good to see Peter and Ruth. I think they're really the connection we have with your congregation. Peter and Ruth came to a Story the Bible workshop that we were running in Greenacre, I think a couple of years ago. And of course, we uh, know uh, their youngest son, Jared, and uh, of course, Bethany. Uh, they've just become members of Wycliffe Bible Translators, and so they'll be familiar to you as well. Well, I've been a member of Wycliffe Bible Translators since uh, 1989. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> I uh, worked in Papua New Guinea for 13 years and it was there I met my wife, Margaret, and uh, she uh, joined Wycliffe in 1996. And uh, so um, I'm actually an accountant by profession. So not all people who work with Wycliffe are linguists because the, the work takes a team. Uh, there needs to It takes quite a long while. It can take anything from seven to... Um, 35 plus years to, uh, to do a Bible translation. So uh, it's important that uh, there are support workers to help support the linguists on the field. So um, I met Margaret in Port Moresby. She was with, working with Youth with a Mission. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we were the two unattached white people at a Papua New Guinean church. And they say, oh, well, we mat- match made you. So, <laughs> so that's, that's great that they did. We, uh, had a little bit a uh, part of it as well, but they, it was great uh, that we met their like-minded people in Port Moresby. So we did a variety of roles. I morphed out of accounting into regional centre management, which we did in Port Moresby and uh, uh, with visas and uh, so forth and people coming and going from the guest house. 
and uh, uh, finally we morphed into government relations and public relations and we've even morphed further now because we've come back to Australia, we came back to Australia in 2004 uh, when uh, the director, uh, we didn't have a New South Wales director so we came back to represent Wycliffe and to uh, help manage the work in New South Wales. So now we, um, we come and talk to churches and uh, about the work of Wycliffe and uh, we uh, hope to inspire people as well as recruit people for that very important task. And, um, and <coughs> we also run little programs like a story of the Bible and uh, 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 we teach people about culture so that uh, that helps with... Uh, people's awareness in evangelism as they, uh, they realise that there's a different culture when you work, walk outside the church door and uh, training in culture and understanding my culture and the people's culture out there helps us to really connect at a deeper level. So we've got these little training workshops that help people hear and also help people understand more about what uh, linguists do on the field. And, uh, but COVID has, of course, affected uh, what we do. I'm sure COVID has affected all of you, and uh, here you are sitting spread out and socially distanced. <laughs> and uh, so we've uh, done a lot of online workshops, and uh, I'm, I think everyone is a bit Zoom fatigued, uh, and uh, we've, uh, I've discovered it takes a lot longer to prepare uh, a, a talk over the internet than it did face-to-face. -face. And I love face-to-face -face much more. I really love being here today because I can see you and interact with you, and we'll look forward to doing that a bit more over. Uh, we will have a little uh, COVID-friendly uh, display down the back at the end of uh, the service today. But of course, you've heard of um, uh, Bethany and Jared and Nathaniel, and uh, they've been a bit affected by COVID-19 as well. They've uh, joined uh, as members this year. Uh, in 2018, they went to Vanuatu to see if Vanuatu was the place that God was calling them to be involved in Bible translation and literacy. And they've been in discussions with the, uh, uh, the Vanuatu directors uh, since then. And, uh, but of course, they're now organising a partnership of people to uh, support them prayerfully and uh, financially. And it's a bit challenging during COVID to do that kind of thing, isn't it? So uh, I'm sure they would value your prayers and uh, uh, as they raise a partnership team, as well as continue discussions about where uh, the Lord would have them serve, perhaps Vanuatu, or perhaps he has something, uh, some other assignment in mind. But uh, I, you know what they look like. I've got a picture of, of them here, it's probably too small to see, <laughs> but uh, if you uh, want to, I'll put that up at the table at the end, but I'm sure if you would like a prayer card or uh, access to more information about uh, Jared and Bethany, you can see Peter and Ruth and they'd be happy to help you. Another couple who've just been underway um, are Greg and Rachel Ship. The Ships actually studied at the SILA, SIL Australia School with uh, uh, the Achilles and last year and um, so they were hoping to go to Mexico. Do you think you can get to Mexico? <laughs> no. <laughs> the borders to Mexico are quite closed so uh, it's uh, been a challenge. They didn't want to be sitting on their hands and so they were in discussions with uh, their, uh, their partners and uh, with the uh, leadership of the SIL uh, branch in uh, Northern Territory and so that's where they've decided to go. And uh, they're working there, as, and uh, Rachel is a, is a language surveyor, and uh, so she'll be studying uh, whether languages are very closely related and whether one needs a translation and can use the translation of that language or needs a different one. And, uh, and they'll be studying how vital those languages are in the Northern Territory. So they'd appreciate prayer. They have uh, two little girls. Uh, they have Elodie and uh, Micah and they'd value your prayers as uh, Elodie and Micah settle into, uh, into preschool uh, locally and uh, as that they make good uh, contacts and friends as they uh, start their work in, uh, in the Northern Territory. I've, of course, I have a little picture. I should have got them put up on the big screen, shouldn't I? But there's, uh, there's Greg and Rachel and Elodie and Micah there. I think uh, I love to tell these stories because these are the real people and they're the face of what uh, Wycliffe is all about. And they're actually going to do translation. As I said, translation is not the only thing that people in our organisation do. You can be a language surveyor. You can uh, do professional studies in linguistics. You can be at... Um, all of our field workers have a training 
focus and we want to empower local citizens in, uh, in translation and uh, the, the tasks that we're involved in. But there are many other things. There's literacy and uh, there's uh, media and publishing, uh, of course, accounting, aviation. It takes quite a team. There's school teachers. You've got to have a place to, uh, uh, for people who work on the field for quite a few years to uh, um, have their kids come and get an education and that kind of thing. And there are many different places uh, that people work. Uh, of course, a huge location was Papua New Guinea because it's a language with, uh, with more than 800 languages. And uh, so there's a lot of linguists work in Papua New Guinea, a bit, very big field with a great big support team. But there's uh, many people who work in uh, uh, other locations, even some that are in uh, uh, um, creative access countries where, it's, uh, where we can't even mention their name because of uh, the dangers that it might cause to the people that they work with. So there's a, a huge variety of uh, work and where people work and, uh, and uh, that's uh, an exciting thing because what Wycliffe people want more than anything else is that uh, people should have the Bible in their own language because that's the best way to really understand the deep things that the Bible teaches. It's not really sufficient to have it in a trade language. Uh, we've found many times that if it's in a language that people only half understand, they don't really grasp it and we get uh, a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about the deep things that the Bible wants to um, what God wants to teach us through his word. And of course, Wycliffe isn't the one who sends people, it's the church, it's people like you. We work in partnership. We uh, have a certain amount of expertise in helping people to get to the field and, uh, help, and providing uh, member care and, and the structures that they need to go. But we do that in partnership because really, biblically, it's the church that sends people out and uh, supports and is, has the joy and the privilege of being part of this, uh, this work. Well, the work of Bible translation is a bit daunting. I just want to give you a bit, few statistics. Don't forget I'm an accountant. Do you love statistics? Maybe you'll fall asleep. But uh, here's a few. How many languages in the world do you think there are? It's over 7,000. These are statistics from 2019. It, the statistics say there's 7,353 languages spoken by the 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. Now, it is encouraging that uh, 3,384 of those languages do have some translation. 698 have a, a whole Bible, 1,548 have a New Testament, and then 1,138 have uh, some scripture portions translated into them. And another encouraging figure is that there are 2,617 languages with uh, active translation or preparation work happening. That's amazing, isn't it? There's been a real push to start language translation for all those people that need it. But our language assessors have been working away, people like Rachel, and they know that there's 2,115 languages still in the, wor in the world that don't have any translation that have a likely need of uh, translation to happen. So that's a, it's a daunting task, isn't it? And uh, so we still need to be praying uh, for God to raise up people to be involved as linguists and for God to raise up people to keep supporting them as they go on the field. And certainly that God will inspire his church to be involved in this very vital work of translation so that all people uh, have access to God's word in their own language. Thanks. Now, <clears throat> Robert asked us to do a hymn, but we can't sing. I'm not going to try and sing it for you, but Margaret's going to play some mood music and I'm going to read it. And the words are going to come up on the screen. And we'll see how that goes. Just got to find the words. Oh, come. O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, O wisdom from on high, who ordered all things mightily, to us the path of knowledge show and teach us in its ways to go. O come, O come, great Lord of might, who to your tribes on Sinai's height in ancient times 
did give the law in cloud and majesty and awe. O come, O branch of Jesse's stem, unto your own and rescue them. From depths of hell your people save and give them victory o'er the grave. O come, O bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar. Dispel the shadows of the night and turn our darkness into light. O come, O King of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our King of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. Now, we know that um, the uh, mission organisation is called Wycliffe, but who can tell me who it's named after? Yes. First name was John. When did he live? He was in the mid-1300s. He was born about 1330. He was a real pioneer uh, of the Reformation. He, he sort of actually was one who got the ball rolling in many ways. He didn't actually do the entire translation himself. He was a, uh, at Oxford University at the time. He was a theologian. But he was convinced, he believed that everybody should have the Bible in their own language because at the time, biblical knowledge in the community was really rock bottom. You could only hear the Bible read in Latin and if you didn't happen to speak Latin, you had no idea what they were saying. He was criticised by the church hierarchy and one of the criticisms that they made was that by translating the Bible into common English, he was debasing the scriptures and making it common and that the pearls of scripture would be trodden underneath feet like, like pearls before swine. That's, that's the criticism that was levelled against uh, John. And, and they said that not only that, but even women would be able to read it. And so with that, um, Margaret, who didn't, no John Wycliffe personally is going to come and read for us. This reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> <clears throat> the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of uh, vengeance of God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord in a display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the place long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated by, for generations. Aliens will shepherd our flocks, your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you'll be called priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. 
Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion of their land and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the people. All who see them will acknowledge that they are people the Lord has blessed. I will delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with a garment of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head with, uh, like a priest, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil uh, makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds, seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. And thank you once again, Peter, for making it as tall as a giraffe here for me. <laughs> yes, uh, let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, it is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. We pray that your spirit would come and open our eyes to uh, truth from Isaiah today. We pray that you'd speak to our hearts and uh, that you would show us what you want us to take away from what we hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wonder if you feel overwhelmed. Have you felt overwhelmed? I think in coronavirus season, it's uh, uh, a bit easier to feel overwhelmed, isn't it? I think many people would like 2020 to end quickly and get back to some sense of normal. But even uh, things that are, are normal uh, um, <coughs> are often, um, our lives are full of ups and downs, but especially so in this season. I'm not sure how affected uh, Bathurst has been. I know Tamworth hasn't been particularly affected, but many of our colleagues in Melbourne are still under a fairly strict lockdown because of the second wave. And uh, it's very sad to see that. But I almost can't watch the international news at the moment. It's too sad to see those numbers of people who have died and whose uh, uh, lives and livelihoods have been affected in immense ways is, is very, very sad and challenging. So coronavirus may loom large in our minds, but uh, so-called normal has its own challenges as well. There's a mixture of the good and the bad in everyone's so-called normal lives. The well-known devotion writer Oswald Chamber, Chambers uh, often said, life is more tragic than orderly. So even when life returns to normal, it can be overwhelming. And as for Wycliffe Bible translators, uh, I want to inform people about uh, the needs in mission, but as you heard from the numbers, that itself is quite uh, overwhelming and daunting, isn't it? And uh, it's at God's heartbeat, uh, but it's a huge task that still stands before us. So perhaps you feel overwhelmed and burdened by some of the things that I've mentioned. Or well, how can we deal with life when we feel overwhelmed? Well, the insights that we get from listening to Isaiah can help us in the midst of our feelings of overwhelm, being overwhelmed. At the outset, I just wanted to say that Isaiah itself is a bit overwhelming. It's 66 chapters, and uh, to really get around and to understand what the book is about, it would require probably a whole term to look into it. This 20-minute sermon is going, to be, uh, is going to be a very brief treatment it's overwhelming for the reader, it's overwhelming for the preacher. But I hope today to leave you with a bit of a panorama of and an introduction to the book of Isaiah and a bit of a look into the verses uh, that we looked at today from Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. Now I thought about how we need to stand back and how it's great to stand back and get a panoramic view uh, of things to really understand. Uh, last week, Margaret and I came uh, back from uh, West Wyalong, where my mother-in-law's house is, to Tamworth, and uh, we passed through Turawina. Does anyone know Turawina? 
It, yes, it's a great place, isn't, isn't it? So the plains around Coonabarra Bran are very flat and vast and very interesting. But then off in the distance, that gives you a wonderful view of the Warrumbungal Mountains. The peaks and the crags and the cliffs and the, and the falls uh, are all quite interesting and visible and you get a good view of them. And uh, that's what I hope we'll have today. We'll stand back today and look at the book of Isaiah and get a bit of a panorama as to uh, what it's about so that we can understand the details better. And I hope that it'll whet your appetite to dive more into the book because it's such a special book indeed. It's, uh, some have called it the Romans of the Old Testament because of the way it draws together so many themes uh, of the Old Testament for us. Well, over two and a half thousand years ago, the young man called Isaiah stood in the Jerusalem temple and heard God calling him to be a prophet. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 says, the vision concerning uh, Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amos saw during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So Judah and Jerusalem, its capital was, uh, was Isaiah's home and it lay at the centre of the known world at the time. So uh, it was a great place to do business because uh, many other countries bordered on it. So uh, Uzziah and the kings of Judah uh, were of the line of the famous King David. God had promised great things to King David, as you remember, to uh, build a house for David, but it was a different kind of house, wasn't it? It wasn't a physical house. It was going to be a dynasty of kings. And uh, it was said that, the, the, uh, that an ancestor of David would build uh, the dynasty that would last for all time, forever. So the people of Judah lived with a conviction that the Lord was the true king and looked forward to the day when everyone would know and see that. So in chapter 6, verse 6, we uh, hear how Isaiah was commissioned by the Lord to be a prophet. Let me read that for you. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Well, this commission happened in the year that King Uzziah died and we know it as 740 BC. Well, coming face to face with the Lord, high and exalted and seated on his throne, um, caused a powerful reaction in Isaiah, didn't it? He realised his people were people of unclean lips. The people of Judah and Jerusalem were sinful people, and so was he. And uh, as the heavenly beings cry, holy, 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 the Lord uh, almighty, the whole earth is full of your glory. Isaiah felt his terrible unworthiness, and uh, he felt that... Uh, uh, he couldn't stand in the Lord's presence and he might actually die because such is the holiness of God. He can't stand to be the, in the presence of sin. But what happened? Yes, Isaiah is unworthy, but God graciously himself took a coal from the altar and uh, that he used to touch Isaiah's lips. And that was his way of atoning for Isaiah's guilt. It was a gracious gift to Isaiah from the Lord. So how, the question of how God can forgive Isaiah and the people of Judah and Jerusalem, and anyone for that matter, is certainly a, a huge issue that's taken up in the book of Isaiah. Well, what do we know about Isaiah himself? Not really that much, really. There are some details 
in the book uh, uh, that provide us a few biographical details. He was probably high born because he uh, spent time with the kings and had ready access to them. Also in chapter eight, we learn that he had a small band of disciples and uh, that were gathered around him, including his wife, who was apparently a prophet, and uh, probably two of his sons as well. But beyond this, there really isn't very much. But what we do know is uh, that Isaiah's vision and his mission were the things that dominated completely and consumed him in his life. And this is the thing that helped him uh, in the midst of being overwhelmed and troubled because Isaiah had certainly had plenty of trouble uh, taking place all around him in Jerusalem and Judah as he carried out his mission. And we're gonna have a look at that now. It was all looking pretty good when King Uzziah died. King Uzziah uh, had reigned for 52 years and by the end of his reign, uh, the enemy nations had largely been subdued or that they were preoccupied with other enemies to fight. Uh, and uh, so there weren't really a lot of problems. It was, and uh, so Judah was the Southern Kingdom and there was a Northern Kingdom because you might remember that the United Kingdom under Solomon was broken down. And so uh, the um, Kingdom now is two and Judah and Jerusalem are the Southern Kingdom. Well, under Uzziah and in the North, um, they had actually recovered a lot of the uh, territory that had been lost. And so they were uh, well um, placed to, uh, to make lots of money and out of uh, being in that ideal situation amongst the nations. And uh, they'd had very effective military campaigns. However, at the end of Uzziah's reign, there were cracks and worries starting to develop. There was a forceful a Syrian king, and he'd come along uh, five years before Uzziah died. And it was terrible because um, all of the kingdoms between Assyria and Judah were breaking down, and he was there just about on the border. And at home in Judah, there were domestic cracks as well. There was a growing gap between the wealthy and poor, and uh, there was uh, exploitation and uh, repression, and there their love of God had turned in empty religious observ into empty religious observance. And from that time on, uh, in the period covered in the first 35 chapters of Isaiah, Assyria was the one to dominate the scene. Sometimes the reigning king made unwise alliances and uh, against the Assyrians uh, with weak allies. Sometimes a king, there was one king who, uh, who threw in his lot with Assyria and uh, it resulted in having to pay lots and lots of tribute and uh, it opened them up to detestable pagan practices. And another king um, was uh, unwise in starting uprisings against Assyria in a premature sort of way and it didn't work and uh, put them in the threat of being crushed, uh, having their dissension crushed. And so in chapters 36 to 39, we see a pivot take place in the book of Isaiah. These chapters show how the Assyrian kings, uh, Sennacherib, laid sage siege to Jerusalem. But God intervened and uh, he saved uh, Jerusalem from the hands of the Assyrians, but not before the whole of Judah was lying in ruins and smoking. Now by um, that time, another crisis was looming in chapters 38 and 39. We see that King Hezekiah was sick, okay, and he received some supportive people from a little land called Babylon, and they were very nice to him and, and, and supported him and said how sad it was he was sick. But Hezekiah made the mistake of showing the wealth of his kingdom, a bit of a proud man showing the wealth of his kingdom. And... Uh, that uh, started Babylonian interest in coming and, uh, uh, to uh, Judah. And of course, that was a shadow because uh, some years later, they came and sacked Jerusalem and dragged the people off in exile. So you can see that all of these things were very disturbing in and turbulent times. Coronavirus might be bad, but how would you like to be Isaiah? He is God's mouthpiece trying to advise the kings. And, uh, and there's dangerous things happening and uh, it's hard to, su to survive. And uh, 
History, as they experience it, is characterised by constant change and intense threats. So chapters 1 to 39 cover the historical time in which Isaiah lived himself, and the Assyrians were big in the picture. And uh, then after Hezekiah came, his wicked son, Hezekiah was a good king, however, and instituted reforms, but his son was wicked, Manasseh, completely reversed all of his reforms and uh, under his kingship, totally submitted to Assyria. And uh, so he allowed pagan rites and detestable kinds of uh, practices were reintroduced and any dissent was um, ruthlessly put down. Now, tradition has it that in Manasseh's reign, uh, some of Manasseh's men actually put Isaiah to death by sawing him in two. And that's borne out in Hebrews chapter 11, which refers to the uh, faith of the champions, one of whom was sawn in two. Well, in these dark times, it became impossible for him uh, during Manasseh's reign to appear in public. And, uh, but all of this time, Isaiah was clinging to the truth that had been etched on his consciousness at his call. He remembered that in the year King Uzziah died, he had seen the king high and exalted and the whole earth being full of his glory. The truth behind appearances was the Lord himself was the supreme ruler, and this was going to uh, determine the fate of Assyria and Judah alike. The nations were in fact instruments in God's hands, the hands of the Holy One of Israel to achieve his purposes. Assyria had been a rod to chastise the people Uh, in their land. Uh, They were rebellious people, so estranged that they'd hardly knew the Lord anymore. Babylon would come along and take them out of their land completely. But the Lord was using these movements of history to restore a repentant remnant who would uh, comfort and redeem. He would comfort and redeem them, a people that would love and serve him. Judgment would be the means to discipline the people of Judah and Jerusalem and salvation would emerge from the discipline of that judgment. It's likely that uh, in these silent times, confined by old age and uh, the problems of Manasseh, that uh, Isaiah himself wasn't really able to appear in public at all. But uh, it's in this time that the Lord revealed to him about the future, which we see in chapters 40 to 66, uh, which includes the passage we read today. And uh, it's amazing uh, what he revealed uh, about himself and what he was going to do. So in the first half of Isaiah, we see Isaiah's commission in chapter 6, and it was one of judgment on the people. In the second half, there's another commissioning that happens in Isaiah 40, and it's one to show comfort to the troubled peoples of Israel, uh, sorry, of Judah and Jerusalem. They must indeed have been comforted down the years while they were exiles by those Babylonians and uh, they must have been comforted when King Cyrus of Persia let them come back to Jerusalem, uh, but they had such a job to uh, start rebuilding uh, Jerusalem, which had been torn apart. So let me read the first two lines Uh, of uh, Isaiah 40, which talk about the comfort uh, for which Isaiah was commissioned to bring his people. He says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So the background information makes it fairly plain what's taking place in Isaiah chapter 61 uh, that we had read earlier, particularly when we realise who are the ones that are speaking. In uh, verses 1 to 6, we hear a person who's an anointed preacher. And uh, we, in verse 7 to 9, we hear the Lord himself who confirms the words of these anointed pre- this anointed preacher. And then 10 to 11 we hear a man who's rejoicing about God's great love and grace uh, for those who've been forgiven and redeemed. And most possibly that's probably Isaiah himself speaking there. 
So let me just concentrate on the voice of the anointed preacher and read those verses again. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for, all, for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting for the Lord, for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. So the anointed preacher is introduced uh, but speaks, is not introduced rather, but he does speak with great authority. It's the spirit of the sovereign law that's upon him. He is the one and the same person who's described uh, as the shoot from the stump of Jesse on whom uh, we learnt that the spirit of the Lord would rest from Isaiah chapter 11. He is that descendant who would become the eternal king. And this is one and the same as the servant of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 42, who the Lord upholds because he is the chosen one in whom the Lord delights. The Lord said, I'll put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. And he is the same servant in Isaiah 52 and through to uh, the end of chapter 53, of whom it said, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. This is the servant who was the final answer to that mystery of how God can possibly forgive the sins of people and yet remain just. He does it through the perfect sacrifice which he himself provides through the anointed preacher. And such as the brilliance of Isaiah, uh, it becomes obvious uh, that there was... Um, there was judgment for the people by God being chastened by the Assyrians and exiled by the Babylonians. And, uh, but there is a greater judgment and it mentions the day of vengeance of our, uh, of our God in verse two. And the preacher warns about those words and then he says, there's also a greater salvation than simply coming back to the land, uh, significant though coming back to the land uh, that was. So the anointed preacher dis describes this in verse 2 as the year of the Lord's favour. This is an allusion to the jubilee year in the tradition of the people of God described in the law of Moses as every 50th year it was proclaimed where there was a release of debts and they were cancelled and slaves were freed and people who had been forced to sell family property because of poverty would give it back, would get it back again. But of course through what the suffering servant has done, there's an even greater release. And that release is from condemnation because of sin in the sight of the Holy One of God. He himself has provided the perfect sacrifice. Isaiah shows us that the King and Saviour and the suffering servant are all the one person. And it's breathtaking, isn't it, when Jesus begins his ministry that he was handed the scroll of Isaiah and turned to these very words we've just read in the synagogue at Nazareth and starts to read them. He reads verses 1 and 2 and he clearly takes on himself uh, those verses and he says, you have heard this fulfilled today in your presence. And you could have just heard a pin drop uh, by the people in the assembly. So we hear everyone spoke well of Jesus but what were the people thinking? Probably they were thinking about the king from the line of David who would uh, get rid of enemies and perhaps like the Assyrians or the Babylonians, this king would get rid of the Romans, which were giving them a hard time. And uh, maybe he would restore uh, their, their um, Juru Ju Ju Judah and Jerusalem to the glorious uh, kind of state that they had under King Solomon. But Jesus makes a, a, um, some statements that sort of make them sit up and think. 
He reminds them after they have said such nice things of him that, uh, that um, when uh, Elijah uh, went to, that Elijah went to a widow who was uh, suffering because of the judgment of the Lord on uh, <coughs> Ahab. And uh, so there was a famine and, uh, throughout the land. And Jesus said, Jesus said that, uh, that Elijah didn't go to the widows of Israel. He went to a woman from Zarephath who was a foreigner. And then he reminded them that uh, Elisha, Elijah's uh, disciple, didn't go to cleanse uh, all the lep- lepers in, in, uh, in Israel, but he went to a foreign man to Naaman the Syrian and cleansed him. So they get very upset now. Jesus isn't speaking about helping them and getting rid of the Romans. He's uh, speaking about the blessings for the nations. And it's very plain that Israel was supposed to be instituted for the blessing of the nations. You think back to Abraham and the covenant with Abraham was that God would bless them and that they would be a light to the nations. And uh, they'd forgotten that. But out of this scourging process that they've gone through, uh, God was wanting to raise up a group of people who are truly repentant. And uh, they were described in Isaiah 61 as those who mourn, the servants of God in Isaiah 65, and the humble and contrite in spirit who tremble at the Lord's word in Isaiah 66. They're the nucleus from which the new faithful people of Israel would grow. And God wants to keep growing the faithful people, doesn't he? So I hope you're not overwhelmed with what we've seen here, but uh, inspired that the great holy God of Israel is the one who stand above all uh, kings in history. And he's the one, um, as the anointed preacher says in Isaiah 61, that there's a time of opportunity and uh, we should be thankful for that. It's the, the time of jubilee and of forgiveness. And we, uh, there's also a time when this will come to an end, the day of judgment, and we need to uh, take hold of God's mercy. In an overwhelming world, it helps to know that our eternal lives are in his hands when we trust in Jesus and uh, that he uh, cares for us. And, uh, and we, we know that uh, the, the sorrows and troubles and overwhelming things of this world will pass away when he completely remakes uh, a new heaven and a new earth that is without sin. But there's also comfort for us in the midst of the ups and downs, isn't there? And I love this verse, these verses from Psalm 139. The writer says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would number, outnumber the grains of sand. And then he went on to make it clear that this all-powerful, holy one of God who is vastly wise, he knows us intimately and uh, better than we know ourselves and cares for us even uh, from the time before we are born. In Isaiah, we see that uh, there's an inward flow. The nations come to share the gospel and uh, we see that there's, uh, that presupposes an outward flow. Isaiah 66 says that the redeemed uh, go out to spread the message and that the exiles uh, spread the glory of God. Now, I've got to confess myself that I'm often daunted and feel inadequate and overwhelmed just at sometimes at ordinary everyday things, but especially when God pushes me forward in his work. But we're not alone. God has sent his comforter and he invented the church. And uh, so we're part of a family and uh, to bless and help one another in, uh, in these things. And when it comes to being involved in the things that are close to God's heart, Uh, I suspect it won't be very often that uh, someone is called to such a massive task as Isaiah. As we've seen, he experienced many troubles. And certainly none of us will be like Jesus because he is the only one who is the anointed preacher, the king of the line of David. No one but Jesus can die for the sins of the whole world. Uh, He is a one-off. But in the world, um, many... uh, um, as many mission representatives say, there's lots of things that we all can be involved in and we can be interested, we can give, we can go. So God may call us to uh, uh, lofty tasks, but uh, we're a part of the family and it's at his heartbeat and he wants us 
to be involved in the way that he gives each one of us. So let's be people who are like Isaiah and when he prompts us, whatever he asks us to do, to say what Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. Thanks. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. The Lord engage you in his mission in Bathurst this week. Amen.